Well, welcome everybody, man. So glad you're here worshiping with us today. Hey, is anybody ready for college football? I mean, it's here. I think it's finally here at last. Can't wait, man. I love it. And inevitably what we're going to hear over the next few weeks is this, as these guys continue to get to play, hopefully, you're going to hear somebody say at a critical moment where a key player may, you know, get injured or for whatever reason can't come back in the game and some other guy's going to come off the bench and get into the game. And after it's all said and done, there'll be an interview and, and somebody will put a microphone in this kid's face and he'll say, you know what? Our attitude is just next man up. It's just next man up. And and what does that mean? Next man up. It means whenever your five star, if you're an Alabama or an LSU fan goes down, right? Y'all just rolled another five star in. But for some of us, look, our only three star goes down, man. We way down the list, right? Y'all know what I'm talking about. It's like, oh snap, what's going to go on? Next man up. It means that we're a team and that everybody on the team's got a role. You got a jersey on, man. That means you got to contribute. And if one of our star players may, may have to sit out a play or their helmet came off or they got ejected for targeting, the next man up, somebody's got to come up and step up and fill in that gap. Here's the deal. Great teams are built with that mentality, next man up. And what I want to submit to you today is that great churches are also built with that same mentality, next person up. The next one who steps forward to fill in the gap. That has to be the mindset of our church family. Pine Lake is not one person or a few people working and the rest of you watching. That's not it. God has designed your life in such a way that you have something to offer and to contribute, not only to us as a church family, but to the world at large. I'm asking you today to consider, pray, say, God, am I, am I to be the next one up? And if so, what does that look like for me? How could I, God, be one who does good and serves others so that we as a church family, listen, can fully function as the body of Christ, but past that so that the kingdom of God would be fully brought right here where we live in our community today? Now, Paul wrote about this idea of doing good, being the next person up in the book of Ephesians chapter 2. So if you have a Bible, open it up, Ephesians chapter 2. We're going to look at, starting at the first of that chapter, we're going to look at a beautiful transition and then a transformation by the time we get to verse 10. The transition is from death to life and and several other, other ways this transition takes place. But here it is. Ephesians 2, beginning in verse 1, reads like this. And you were dead... In your trespasses and sins in which you formerly walked. Now, underline that word walked if you have your Bible out because we're going to come back to that word in a little bit in verse 10. The the word walk means it's your way of life. This is the way I used to live. This is the way I used to get down. This is is what characterized my existence. In which you formerly walked according to to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that's now working in the sons of disobedience. Remember, last week we talked about a person being lost, about a person being sick, being held captive. That's what these verses are, are describing. Among them, it says, we too formerly lived, the idea is being tossed back and forth, We lived in the lust of our flesh, indulging the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And we were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Now, let me just stop right there and say, what have we contributed so far in this scripture? Nothing but bad. Man, we're dead. We're we're, we're jacked up in the way we're living. We are a total wreck and mess. But God, but God being rich in mercy because of his great love with which he loved us, Even when we were dead in our transgressions, he made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you've been saved. And he raised us up with him, talking about Jesus Christ, and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one can boast. What we contributed was just a lot of sin and death and and discord. What did God contribute? He contributed to the transition. He's the one who took you from death to life, from enemy to child, from captive to freedom. It's all accomplished, Paul says, by God's grace, not by your deeds, not by your actions, not according to your good works. Now listen, we need to hear that, especially if you're, you're with us today and you live uh, in Mississippi or you live in the Bible Belt, because a lot of us were raised maybe even a religious tradition thinking that if, if God's going to be happy with me, I've got to be good. And that is not what the Bible says. The Bible says none of us are good, but thank God he's good. And so he's the one by his grace that allows you to experience life and freedom and hope. 
But then there's this transformation that takes place in your life once you come into Christ by faith and through his grace. There's a transformation that takes place. You go from being a taker, always needy because you're empty. Man, you get filled up. You become a new person and you're now a giver. This is verse 10. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works. I've emphasized that, made it all caps so that you'll see it. For good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God saved you by grace, but he saved you for good works. God's intention in having a relationship with you is that it would result in your life being transformed, that you would stop being a taker, needy, and always looking to get some, but that you would actually have a life that you now have something to give for good works. These good works that God wants for you to do. And I don't care if you're in the fourth grade or the third grade, or if you're 40, or, or if you're 70 years old, if you're a college student, employed, unemployed, listen, God's got good works that he wants you to do. These good works reflect the character and action of God. These are the result of the fruit of, the outcome of you having a relationship with God. Good works in your life are the result, the outcome of your relationship with God. They're the goal. They're the thing that God wants for you. This is why he, what he desires for you. And they're the purpose of your life. It's why God leaves you on this earth. He leaves you here to accomplish his good works. And so the question for us today is, God, what good works would you have me to do today? You see, you're not just saved from death. You're saved to a brand new kind of life. You're no longer, please hear me, would you receive this? You are no longer, as a Christ follower, you're no longer a taker. You have everything you need in Jesus. You now, your identity is you're a giver. You have something to offer the world around you. Salvation, relationship with God, produces good works from a transformed life. Please hear me. I need to reiterate it again because we get this jacked up in our brain. Good works cannot get you to God and to heaven or saved, whatever you want to call that. But they are the true indication that you do have God, that you are experiencing heaven in the, in the presence of God in your life on a daily basis. Now, James talked about this correlation um, between faith and doing good from a different perspective. Paul's really emphasizing nine verses about grace, but it has to result in good works. James, the half-brother of Jesus, wrote this. He said in James 2.14, What use is it, my brethren, if someone says he has faith, but he has no works, can that faith save him? Now, James is talking to a specific situation where people in their congregation thought as long as they believed in God, they're good. That it didn't have to really make any difference in their life, especially when it came to the way they treated other people. But James is going to blow that up, and he starts giving examples from the Old Testament about people who had faith, but then that transitioned into or translated into a changed life. Abraham, the father of faith, he would say in James 2, consider him. That dude believed, man, he believed in that belief that faith was reckoned to him as righteousness, but his faith was proven whenever God asked him to do the hardest thing I think anybody in the Bible was ever asked to do, probably maybe as much even as, as Jesus laying down his own life, it was Abraham being asked to take the life of his son Isaac. And I don't know if y'all know that story, but you need to turn to Genesis 22 sometime later today and read it and just see how a man who believed that there's nothing impossible with God, God's so good that even if he asked me to do the unthinkable, God would turn it into a beautiful thing. But before he could do that, before he could do that, God stopped him. So he didn't ask him to do only God gave his only son for us. God's heart of a father. He sacrificed that way, right? But, but James says, hey, those works, that, that even that willingness, those steps of obedience proved that he really had faith. He said, if you don't like Abraham, let's go to, the other, let's go to another person, a, a non-Jewish person, a girl named Rahab, who had a pretty bad reputation. Can we just say that? If you know her last name, it's the harlot. Everywhere she's mentioned in scripture, it's always Rahab the harlot. She was a prostitute. Her, her, her old way of life marked her for a long, long time. But she lived in a place called Jericho. Maybe y'all remember Joshua fought the battle of Jericho on their way into the promised land. It's the first battle. They march around the walls. But before they marched around the walls, there were two spies who had been sent into Jericho to kind of do a little reconnaissance. They felt like people were watching them and knew they were there. So they went to the only place that most guys could go and everybody say, well, whatever. They went to Rahab's house. And she, the Bible says, by faith 
hid those guys and, and asked them, hey, save me whenever y'all take over this place. And they said, okay, but you've got to drop a purple cord out of your window. Come on, y'all remember going to Bible school, Sunday school? Y'all remember this story? She lets them down, out of, you know, she lets them down, uh, gets them out of the house, but she drops down that purple cord and then she is rescued whenever the Israelites take over. James says, hey, it was her faith that then acted. James 2.26, he says, listen to those two stories. For just as the body without the spirit is dead, so also faith without works is dead. But the, the context of it is James is saying, hey, if a brother or a sister came to you and they were hungry or lacked clothes, and you said to them, hey, man, I'm going to be praying for you. Dude, go in peace, be warmed, be filled in Jesus' name. He said, dude, what good is that? You have not helped your brother out. James 2.17, even so, faith, if it has no works, is dead being by itself. So please, the correlation, the correlation is both Paul and James are saying the same thing. Yes, you are saved by grace through faith, but you are saved for good works. Your life has to demonstrate, must demonstrate, it's, it's going to demonstrate transformation. Now, with the balance of our time, let's talk about three ways that you can do good. All right, three ways that you can begin to do good, that God wants good things to come out of your life. Here's kind of where you can start wrapping your mind around what that would look like from Ephesians 2.10. From Ephesians 2.10, first place is do good out of your vocation and your passion. Do good out of your vocation and your passion. Look back at Ephesians 2.10. It says, for we are his workmanship. Now put that in all caps because that's what we're emphasizing. We're going to go all the way through the verse this way. For we are his workmanship. Actually, the first word in the Greek text is his, because just like he emphasized in our relationship, in our salvation, man, it's all God's work. In the same way, us doing good, you doing good, it begins with God. You are his workmanship. That word workmanship means it, you're his creation. The transliteration of the Greek word workmanship is literally poem. You are God's poem. You are God's masterpiece. You are God's work of art, handmade. That's who you really are. The, the truth is, the, the point of this whole section is your relationship with God is because of God. He's done everything to make it happen. He loved you. He sent Jesus to give his life for you, to pay for your sins and the forgiveness of your sins. He raised you up in the spirit and he seated you in the heaven so that you can one day experience just how amazing God is. And one day when we get to heaven, we're going to say, Jesus, I had no idea. Thank you so much. And look, even as a faith family, would you right now with, with me just say, God, thank you, Father. Thank you, Son. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for your work in my life. God, I'm your workmanship. So when it comes to serving and helping others, it's the same way. It's God's doing, God's power and his creative work put you together. You're his workmanship. You're his product. The Bible says in Psalm 139 verse 13, you were, God, you formed my inward parts. You wove me in my mother's womb. I, I will give thanks to you for I'm fearfully and I'm wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works and my soul knows it very well. David's saying, God, you made me. I'm, I'm your handiwork. God told Jeremiah in Jeremiah 1, 5, he says, listen, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I consecrated you. I've appointed you a prophet to the nations. Throughout the scripture, please hear me. God says, I'm the one who puts a child together in their mama's womb. And he does that on purpose and for a purpose. And I want to say to you, God has shaped you. Everything about your life, God has been at work in you. He's given you your physical characteristics, your gender, your height, your eye color, your metabolism. God's given you innate abilities if you're good in science or math or you're good with art or building stuff. Even your passions come from God. Even after your birth, God continued and continues to shape you, developing those passions in your experiences in life. Some of you are passionate about sports or cooking or travel or working with kids or plants or whatever it is. You just love. It. Your experiences, good or bad, through your life, they've been used to shape you. Years ago, I did a Bible study called Experiencing God. Some of you may be familiar with that. It's a really old Bible study, but it basically this guy says, if you want to know where God's taking you in the future, look behind you and look at those significant things that God has done in your life, and they'll line up, connect the dots, and it'll show you where God is taking you. That's the big idea that I'm asking you to grasp right now with me. The big idea is this, in you stepping up to serve and you being the next person up in good works, part of what you've got to be aware of is how God has shaped your life with abilities, passions, and experiencing experiences. 
Your serving will be most enjoyable to you and I think most effective with other people when you serve in that sweet spot of where your abilities, your passions, and your experiences all begin to overlap. Now, I'll give you a couple of examples of what I'm talking about, particularly about using your, your vocation and then your passion. But using your vocation, I know a guy, he's an attorney. Uh, he's going to remain, remain anonymous today um, at his request and because I just think it's the wisest. He's an extraordinarily good attorney. I think he may be the managing partner of a pretty significant uh, law firm. I know that he's a very much uh, an expert in one particular lane of law. But here's what I know. His law firm asks that all the attorneys give 20 hours a year of pro bono work. But this guy gives over 100. Over 100 years of, of free work to ministries, to people, to individuals, to causes that, that he believes are worthwhile or that, that are fulfilling what God wants. Now, that's the reason I wanted him to remain anonymous because some of y'all would come, be coming up to me and saying, hey, man, uh, well, I always need a good attorney. What's his name now? Because y'all need some free help. I get it. I get it. No, he's going to remain anonymous. He, do, he doesn't need the publicity. But, but just know there are good people out there who see themselves as a, as, a, as a person who says, you know what, I've got skills to offer and so I make that available as God shows me how to do that, who to do that with. I'm willing to give of my time. There's a young girl named Carney Holloway who's a part of our church family, raised in Madison, Mississippi, went to Madison uh, Central High School, went to college, elementary education, did her student teaching you know, in, in, in the Jackson Public School system. And while she was there at, at a particular school, she became aware that most of the kids there, 70% of the kids there are considered homeless, meaning they don't have a single place that they would call their home. They bounce between maybe one to three four different relatives, depending on the, the night, the week, the whatever, that, that, that's just their reality. She said 100% of those kids are dependent upon the school for two meals a, a day. And she said she's down there and there was a lot, you know, with family dynamics and other things going on, but, but Carney just sensed that, man, this is what God has for me. We were trying to hire her to be a part of our residency program at Pine Lake, and she turned us down because she felt God was calling her to go work downtown in this school to bless these kids. Now I'm going to fire the guy who's over, you know, losing good, good employees like that. Not really. But, you, but the idea is, man, this girl, look, she had an opportunity to really, from an earthly standpoint, live a totally different existence. But she said, you know what? God's gifted me with an ability to teach, and there's a need, and I want to step toward that. I could tell you about some doctors in our, in our church family who have used their skills on the mission field, various things. I'm just saying to you, would you think about how could you leverage your vocation to do good? What would that look like? God will tell you. But also your passions, the things that just fire you up. Our, our senior staff had our retreat this week, and we were at a guy's deer camp. Now, I call it deer camp, but it's not what you're thinking. I mean, this thing's like fine. It's this huge lodge and nice beds and, and Wi-Fi and, and, you know, all I mean, it's just, it's just unbelievable. So it's not typical deer camp. And so the story on it is he loves to hunt, clearly. He loves it and has this lamb. But then he began to think, you know what? Why would I just use this for myself? I don't want to just use this for myself. And so he's turned his hunting camp into a place where he has uh, fields for athletics, he has basketball courts, he has lodging so that he can bring underprivileged kids, um, disabled, have disabled hunt, hunts for people who are disabled. He can bring in church groups. He can have folks like us to come in and, and use his passion, what he's passionate about. He still hunts, but he uses his passion as a way to give back and to help other people. And I know what some of you guys are thinking. You're thinking, baby, we're going to get in the camp business. That's what we're fixing to do, right? Maybe, maybe not. Maybe. What is your passion? What are you passionate about? Could you turn it into a place where you just say, you know what? I want to do good. I know guys who've turned training into that. Well, there's a guy in our church who does Bible studies at his gym just because he's going. He's, he's, he's turned it into a ministry. There's ways for you to do that. I'm thinking about my daughter, Mackenzie, a friend, uh, Lainey Armstrong. They went to Haiti on a mission trip while they were in high school, fell in love with the people of Haiti. Very, very poor country, not a lot of resources. And they have just fallen in love with the leaders of um, HMM ministry, Hispaniola Mountain ministry. They've fallen in love with them, all the people there, just love them to death. They go back every chance they get. Well, what we've just experienced, Hurricane Laura, when it was Tropical Storm Laura, went across that island of Haiti, and it, it brought devastation. All these people that they love, the school that they serve at, the church, all of it was just 
lots and lots of damage, lots and lots of flooding. Well, you know what? My, my daughter and her friend are passionate about this ministry. So you know what they did? They did what kids do today. They got on social media, hit up everybody they know, and said, man, let's, let's make a difference. And at this point, they've raised over $12,000 to be sent down there to do good. What is that? That's somebody doing good out of a passion. It's not their job. It's just them saying, man, I'm passionate about these people and this cause. What good can I do today? How has God put you together? What abilities, what passion, what experiences do you have that you could leverage to do good? All right, here's another way you can do good. You can do good out of your spiritual gifting. Go back to Ephesians 2.10 again. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for these good works. God made you and put you together in your mother's womb, but then he remade you spiritually when you put your faith in Jesus and you started following him. The Bible calls that being reborn, recreated, and that's a spiritual work. We've learned over the last couple of weeks that the Spirit of God has to bring conviction, showing us our need and his goodness. The Spirit of God actually is the one who makes us new. That's Titus 3.5 where it says he saved us, not on the basis of good deeds which we've done in righteousness, but according to his mercy, by the washing of regeneration. That word means rebirth, making you brand new, and renewing by the Holy Spirit. God's the one who brings this work. The Spirit transforms you, makes you new from the inside out, and then he empowers you. He strengthens you, provides you power and strength to do what it is that he's called you to be and to do. So you walk now not by the desires of your flesh or the strength of your flesh. Listen, you're called, I'm called to live by the desires of the Spirit of God and by the power of the Spirit of God. Now, when Christ through the Spirit dwells in you, his his gifts and his graces are then bestowed on you so that you bear spiritual fruit. That's Galatians 5.22. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. Let me translate that for you. Paul says, when the Spirit of God takes up residence in you, you become different. Would you look at that? Could, Could you say... Could you say your your life now is marked by more love, more joy, more peace, more patience, more kindness, more faith, goodness, more faithfulness, more gentleness, and more self-control than ever before? Are those things increasing in you? All right, track with me now. Because if you can't say yes, Paul would say, Paul would say, and I would second it, you might want to check what's going on in your heart. Because the fruit of the Spirit is, not might be, it is the definitive thing. The Spirit of God brings transformation in your life from the inside out. And those will be yours in increasing measure, all of them. Okay? The Holy Spirit help us. But the Holy Spirit, when he comes and takes up residence in your life, this, he also brings spiritual service. This is 1 Peter 4.10. 1 Peter 4.10 says, As each one has received a special gift, employ it. Use it in serving one another as good stewards of the manifold grace of God. Here's what I want you to see. As each one has received a special gift. Every believer has a special gift from God. The Greek word is just one word, a charisma, a, a spiritual gifting that he's given. It's like a housewarming gift. Come on, any, any ladies, y'all know what I'm talking about? A housewarming gift. Somebody's got a brand new house, and so whenever you go over there, you bring some candles or whatever to say, hey, you know, welcome to your new house. The Holy Spirit, whenever you say, Jesus, I want you to come into my life, the Holy Spirit comes into your life, and he brings a housewarming gift. It's called a spiritual gift. A spiritual gift is simply a place in your life where God supernaturally empowers you and blesses others. But I'll say it again. A spiritual gift is a place in your life where God supernaturally empowers you and blesses other people. There are lots of spiritual gifts mentioned in the Bible. And can I just say that these gifts, I believe, this what we're talking about now is something that God wants you to use within the church body, within the church family. This is not something you're necessarily using outside with the world. This is something that you're using ministering to other believers. You can have gifts of apostleship, prophecy, evangelism, pastoral gifts, teaching gifts. You might have the gift of faith or wisdom or knowledge or discernment. You might have a gift of healing or miracles or tongues or interpretation or helps or administration, service, mercy, leading, giving, encouragement, just naming a few. I don't think that's an exhaustive list. But I think you need to discover what your housewarming gift is. 
How has God uniquely gifted you in a way that empowers you when you do it and it blesses others? Now, sometimes you're going to find yourself at times being asked to serve or wanting to serve in places that don't bless others. It doesn't bless others and it doesn't empower you either. And can I just say to you, spend limited amount of time there. It's not doing you any good or them any good. Sometimes we just have to do stuff because it needs to be done. But that's not where you really want to spend the bulk of your time. Y'all good with that? Okay, sometimes you're going to have things that blesses others, but it doesn't really empower you so much. Spend some time there. Sometimes because you're just a, a believer, you've got good experiences or whatever, God can use that. Spend some time there. There are some things that, em, that empower you. You love it, but it does not bless anybody else. All right, y'all ever, noticed, y'all ever known somebody who thought they could sing? Come on, feel me right now. They thought they could sing. That ain't helping no, but don't ever spend any time doing stuff that you think you're good at, but ain't, it's, it's just killing everybody around you. Right? Our staff's job is to keep you out of that spot. Okay? Where you want to spend the bulk of your time is in that place, which is like a downspout from heaven where it just fills you up. God fills you up, and then, man, it just brings blessing to people. Do you know what yours is? Because you got one. You got one. There are lots of places. Our, our church leadership has been talking about places, even right now, look, coming out of COVID and, and, and we're, we're online and on campus right now, which some of you, that may be news to you, right? But, but we need people to serve both online and on campus. We need folks who say, you know what? I think God has shown me what my spiritual gift is and so I want to serve. We need folks who have hospitality gifting to serve as ushers and greeters and, or maybe online ministers. We need people who have experience with, with, with medicine to serve on medical teams, our, sec, our security team. We need people who have the gift of intercession to serve on our prayer ministry with a war room. We need folks who are gifted, spiritually gifted musicians to play or to sing or to work with technology. We need you right now. We need folks who would serve as missionaries to our city who just have apostolic gifting or prophetic gifting or, or help gifting. We need you to be mentors and tutors with, with, with uh opportunities in the city. Our communication team is looking for folks who are good photographers or maybe writers. Our care center needs people who are gifted in evangelism and helps. Our prison ministry and student ministry need leadership, which prison ministry and student ministry a lot of times are kind of the same, right? I mean, it's kind of like preemptive, right? You're trying to do student ministry to keep them out of prison. And we can't really go into the prisons right now to do a lot of our mentoring, but that's going to that's gonna lift. And maybe you could use your gifting experience, all the things that God's given you to be a part of that ministry, either on on campus or, or in, in, the, in, the, in the prisons themselves. I know our student ministry needs it, 56, 5th and 6th grade, 78, 7th and 8th grade, high school. We need folks who would say, you know what, I've got some gifts and, and I'm in a season of my life where I think I want to give back. My life was changed in the 8th grade when a college student, a college guy, came home from college every weekend and taught my Bible study class. And he impacted, there were probably seven kids in there that were regular kids, and five of us wound up in some form of ministry. And I'm convinced it's because this guy, as a college student, said, I got something to give. And he had a teaching gift, and he came and he used it, and it changed my life. And I'm talking to somebody, you're sitting on the couch right now, and you have a gift. And it's being wasted if you don't say, God, I need an outlet for my gift. I'm reminded of the Dead Sea. I've seen the Dead Sea. You may have heard of the Dead Sea. It's the lowest point on the planet, literally. And the Dead Sea's crazy because it's, it's salty and you can float in and it's fun to frolic in. But can I tell you something about the Dead Sea? It has no outlet and it has no life. No marine life, no plant life, no life. And I'm convinced that those two things go together. When you have no outlet, you have no life. You only receive, but you never give. And somehow you begin to shrivel. And so I'm calling you out. I'm calling you at our online campus to say, you know what? I've got a place to serve. God, show me how I can do good through my gifting. The temptation I know, whether you're on campus and sitting in a pew or online and sitting on your couch, the temptation is to just say, let them do it. But you need next man up mentality. You've got something to offer this faith family, this community, that if you don't step up, our body walks with a limp. That's the picture. We're a body. You got a part to play. If you don't serve, we may walk with a limp. We may not be able to hold what we need to hold or worse. And so I'm saying to you, would you ask God, God, show me what my gifting is. Here's the third way. Here's the last way. 
Do good out of God's revelation, out of your, your vocation and passion, out of your spiritual gifting. Here's a third way. Do good out of God's revelation. This is back to Ephesians 2.10. He says, for we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand so that we would walk in them. God decreed, God planned, God designed beforehand in his mind and his purpose on this planet some things for you to walk in. How far beforehand? Does that mean like before I was, you know, in relationship with him? Yes. Does that mean before you were ever born? Yes. That's why he put you together like he did. He already had a plan. He didn't create you and go, what am I going to do with you? Right? Some of us wonder that, but, but God didn't wonder that. God, God, God already had a plan, and he designed you for that plan. When he says he, planned it, he had planned it beforehand, I think he's hearkening back to Ephesians 1, verse 4, where Paul wrote this. Just as God chose us in Jesus, in him, before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him in love. God, in eternity past, and I'm speaking this over you to speak value over your life. You matter. You, you have potential. You have something to offer the world. And if you're not dead, God ain't done. That's what the song says, and I'm declaring that over you. That you are precious and special and made uniquely for God's purpose and design. I believe he reveals those plans, though, those good things that he has for you. I think he reveals those plans to you one step at a time, one day at a time. And the way that you receive that revelation of what those good plans were from a long time ago is through prayer. And here's the way we define prayer. Prayer is not just talking to God. It's communing with God. You sit with God and say, God, would you talk to me? And you pray, and then you listen, and you say, God... What good do you have for me today? That prayer has the potential to change your life. Once you're in faith, God says, ask me and I'll show you great and mighty things you don't even know. Great and mighty things about God and great and mighty things about what he wants to do through your life. That prayer will change your life. I'm watching it change my wife's life. I've seen for a long time she would, she would get a revelation. She would get inspiration to use art to you know, maybe raise money for a family who was adopting or maybe to send some kids, you know, onto the mission field for a couple of years or bless a ministry downtown. But I'm watching her now that my kids are kind of grown and moving on. Her ministry has become some point in the morning just to say, God, who is it today? Who would you have me reach out to, have lunch with, talk to, whatever? She starts her day that way, and it's made her life full and fun. I'm thinking about some college students at, at Oxford at Ole Miss who a couple of years ago just had this sense that, man, God was telling them to bring passion, the passion band and Louis Giglio to Oxford. Can I just tell you, you don't just say, hey, I think we'll bring them here. That's not the way that works. But they felt like God was revealing that to them. And so they went to calling and praying and connecting. Sure enough, man, a few months later, praise of God filled the pavilion with passion band leading, Louis Giglio speaking. And I, who knows, who knows all the good that was done that night. But I can tell you now, there's one kid that I know who drove and went to that event, whose life and eternity was changed forever. And his life ripple now is touching at least two college campuses that I know of and two professional sports leagues. Because some kids said, God, are you really telling us to try to bring the impossible here? Yes. You know, an another example of that, which would be more low-key, probably won't get the same praise as we had some college kids, three of them over the last couple of months, who said, you know what? The Muslim Hajj is coming up. That's the time when 10 days where Muslims make their journey once in a lifetime to Mecca. And they said, you know what? We just want to pray in this season for those people that they would come to know the real truth of Jesus Christ. And only heaven will tell the ripple of that prayer life. They got a revelation and they just did it. I've got a friend named Jen Feldman. Jen's a part of our church. And um, man, she's a go-getter. And uh, Jan, for the last probably 10 years, has taken her own trip to India. And she just, she, she put it together. She has gone to India. She went to India the first time. And the, the little pastor we were working with said, Miss, Sister Jan, would you come back and lead our women in a, in a women's conference? And so Sister Jan went back two years later. And she and three or four other ladies blessed about 10 or 12 ladies. And now she's gone back every year for the last 10 years or so. And now it's hundreds of ladies that they're blessing. So I asked her, I, I talked to her this week. I said, Jan, how in the world did you wind up? in the backside of nowhere, Magdapali, India. 
And she said, well, Lee and I were living down in Mobile, and there was this lady that lived near us, and all my neighbors said, stay away from her. She's mean. And so Jan was staying away from her until one day, sitting with God, God said, Jan, I want you to go talk to her. And so Jan went and knocked on the door, and there was a little Indian lady that opened up the door. Come to find out, this Indian lady, the one that was so mean, her mom and dad had been killed whenever she was a child. She had been adopted and brought to a foreign land, experienced a lot of trauma, abuse, and drama. And she was a hurting person. And Jan established a friendship with her, learned about the people, and she said, you know what, one day I just may go to India. And you know what? She came home back to Jackson sometime later, took her first trip to India, and the rest is history. How, how, how does it happen? How is she now ministering to hundreds of ladies? Because she followed a revelation from the Spirit in a moment where she's just sitting saying, God, what good should I do today? And God said, just go meet a person. Just go have a conversation and see what God would do. Can I speak over you? If you would begin your day this way, I'm, I'm convinced a lot of y'all are bored to death. You're bored to death. You're so stinking bored with your life. It has no meaning. It has no adventure. It's same old, same old. God wants to show you great and mighty things. If you would start starting your day this way, God, would you just show me what good you want me to do today? Put somebody's name on my mind. Give me a picture of somebody in my, in my mind. God, show me, and I'll do it. And that can happen for you at the office. That can happen for you at school or work or play or wherever it is. God wants to change your life. Some of your most meaningful experiences in your life are going to flow from your time with the Lord receiving his revelation, asking him, what good should I do this day? Now I want to close this way with the last part of that verse. This idea of doing good requires a choice. Look back at verse 210, 210 one last time. We're his workmanship. We're created in Christ Jesus for these good works that God prepared a long time beforehand so that we would walk in them. The purpose, the purpose of God creating these things and, and creating you, his desire is that you would walk in them. Remember I told you to underline that in, in verse three, two or three, right? That you used to walk in craziness and, and apart from God. Now walk, order your steps, let your life every day make progress in, begin to be ordered around, that this begins to characterize who you are. That you choose to do good out of your vocation, your passion, your spiritual gifting, or revelation. This is just who you are. And I'm speaking that over you. This is God's best plan for you. And life and meaning and power and purpose and answer prayer and resources and relationships are going to flow from you choosing to walk in God's best plan for your life. But here's the thing I want you to see. It says, so that we would walk in them. That word would right there in the Greek text, it's a verb, but it's in subjunctive mood. I don't expect you to know what that means. It just means in Greek, subjunctive mood is the mood of potentiality, not certainty. Okay, check, track with this. The mood of certainty, the indicative mood means it's happening. Subjunctive means it could. You ever said, oh, I would do that, but you're not. And God designed that you would live this way. Who am I talking to right now? You're tired of I should, I might, I'm thinking about. God has designed for you to do it, but you have to say yes. You've got to make that choice. You've got to say yes. And here's what I'm saying would happen to you if you did. I think you would honor Jesus who did the best work, not just a good work, he did the best work when he took you from death to life, from enemy to son, when he took you from sinner to saint. He did the best work, and now your giving imitates him. It fulfills his purpose. It honors him. It's your way of saying thank you. When I was in seminary, I had to memorize a, ver a verse, Luke 17, 10. Luke 17, 10 says this, So you too, when you do all the things which you are commanded to do, this is what you're supposed to say. I'm only an unworthy slave. I've only done what I ought to have done. And so I'm saying over us that there's a sense in which us living our lives to honor God is just our way of saying, God, thank you. I don't deserve praise for it. I don't deserve accolades for it. He's done so much for me. I'm just doing this for his honor because he deserves it. You know what else would happen if you lived this way, if you chose this? Man, you would bless people. Because there are a lot of hurting people out there on this planet right now. 
and they're lonely and they're tired and they're fearful and they wonder if they matter. They wonder if anybody knows their name. They wonder if God even sees them. And by you walking in these good works, you're going to bring blessing to their life. And I think the hate meter in our world would go down. The love and joy meter in our world would go up because the body of Christ is living in the power and plan of Christ. And you know what else would happen? I truly believe that you would experience heaven right here on earth. That you would have to wait till one day to experience God as you start to live your life this way. You would begin to experience heaven, the presence of God, the power of God, the revelation and experience of God right now on this earth. The Bible tells you it's more blessed to give than to receive. You know what that means? It means joy would come back. You can't give out without blessing coming back. I think you would have peace. I think you'd lay down on your pillow at night and sleep like a baby because you would be walking in what God has for you. And the Bible just talks about his ability to bless you even in your sleep when your ways are pleasing to him. And you know what? I think you would, you would experience heaven right here through the favor of God. The Bible says God honors those who honor him. Is that true or not? God honors those who honor him. And the spiritual reality is you can't give without receiving back. And whenever you honor God, God has some way of showing up in your life in ways that just let you know he's with you. And one day you're going to hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. You've been faithful in a few things. Now you're going to get to experience a lot of things. You see, great teams, great churches, great lives, and great eternities are all shaped around this phrase, next man up. Who's the next man up? And I think God is calling you and me to say, God, my yes is on the table. What good thing shall I do today? Come on, would you pray with me right now? Just across our, our online campus, would you pray with me? And would you just ask God, God, is there something that you have for me vocationally? Or through my passion? Through my spiritual gifting? Or God, through revelation? Lord, what do you have for me? And would you just listen for a second? What good thing does God have for you? When you begin to let this be your journey, maybe your prayer every day, God show me, what good thing do you have for me? Begin to take inventory of your abilities and passions and experiences, your spiritual gifting and daily getting revelation and a download from the Lord. Some of you, you're in a posture where you're saying, you know, I really need somebody to minister to me because I've wondered if I matter. I've wondered if anybody sees me. And you need some prayer right now. Can I, can I encourage you? Listen, we love you. We want to pray for you right now. God sees you. And if you would just text the word pray right now to 57555 or just engage with one of the ministers on the chat, Look, we'd love to help you, to bless you, to encourage you with prayer right now. Would you do that? But listen, before some of you ever give, you've got to receive. Before you can do these good works, you've got to receive the good work of Jesus. And so if you've never experienced his grace and experienced a relationship with him by faith, would you just right now invite Jesus to forgive you, put your trust in him, say, God, come into my life and change me. I need you. And we want to help you with that with that step and help you take your next step in this journey. And so would you, in just a moment, would you just text the word Jesus to 57555 and we'll help you take your next step. Hey, I'm going to end this prayer time and then uh, our pastors will hang on, our ministers will hang on online. They'd love to chat with you, talk with you, pray with you if you so desire that. But God, we love you. I thank you. I thank you that you've never given up on us. God, I thank you that your plans are good. And Lord, I pray today, would you just open our spirits? That song we sang earlier, God, would you help us to build our lives on your love? It's a firm foundation. But God, would you just fill us with wonder at who you are and fill our hearts with just love for you and love for people. And God, now send us out. Send us out with love for those around us to serve. And so God, would you help us to be the next one up? God, use us for your glory in Christ's name.